This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can voice your opinion on the child welfare system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Today it is my pleasure to bring to you on this episode of Silent Voices a woman named Lisa Smith. Now Lisa has been through a lot with the family court system and she came to tell her story of what she has been through. Thank you so much Lisa for joining us on Skype. Uh, we went into the shelter for the weekend and I'm thinking that well he's you know, left or whatever. Well, we come back home on that Monday, and my daughter uh, went over to a friend's house. I dropped her off at a friend's house, um, and my son was at home by himself, and we had already talked about a safety plan, you know, don't answer the door, th those different things. Right. And he did exactly what he was supposed to do. And when I got home, there were two police officers with their father at my door. And uh, I, they said, we have, we have an order that says that the children need to go with their father. And I flipped. Um, I, I was just, I... I, I just, I don't even know how to describe the feeling because it was just beyond my comprehension. Um, my son was uh, in my bedroom, underneath my bed. Um, it took the police uh, two hours uh, talking to him and me um, I asked for his counselor. I asked for uh, the DFS, that's what they call it here, Child Protective Services. I asked them to call his counselor and DF, uh, DFS. They would not do it. Um, my son was freaking out. I mean, just totally flipping out. Um, and I'm in the other room, and they, they told me that if I did not calm down, that I was going to get arrested. Wow. So, with that being said, um, I, can't, I, I, said, I just couldn't believe that it was happening. I, I was so in shock that I just couldn't believe it. Um, I did not ask them to come into my home. They just followed me into the door. So I was not, I, I was between a rock and a hard place at that particular point. Um, now you stated that it took them two hours to get your son out of the home. What was his response to them saying that he had to go with his father? How did he react to that news? Well, he kept, he kept screaming, I don't want to go with him. He's hurt me. I don't want to go with him. And it, it's like, okay, what, what point is it okay for a child of 13 years old 
I mean, he if he doesn't want to go, then there's a reason why he doesn't want to go. I mean, if he's saying to the police officer, he's hurt me. So what, you know, I don't, I, I still, I do not understand how they, you know, they are there to protect us. No, that you just don't do that. <laughs> It sounds as if he may have been re-traumatized by this experience and the situation that was being forced upon him. Oh yes, oh yes, very, very much so. He, he, um, I, I have worked through my own very, uh, I, I have been diagnosed with PTSD and it has been a very long road. And I know, without a doubt, he's never been able to deal with the, any of this because I, God only knows really what's been holding him. I've talked to my son ten times in three years. Wow. And I call, I call every Wednesday and every Sunday and leave messages and ask to have, a, have him call me back. I assume that you call him two times a week because that's what was court ordered in your particular case. Well, what what it says in the court order, and I, I will give you a copy of that, okay. um, is that I am to have supervised visits. Okay. Um, what that looks like, it doesn't really say. It just says supervised visits. So, and I have, I went back to Iowa uh, last year and uh, proceeded to go to the um, visitation place that I had used once before to see him, and I was denied that visit. His father denied that visit, saying he did not want to see me. I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm speculating that they said you needed supervised visitation because you fled with the children. Is that accurate? Well, that's the impression that I get from this, from this order that I was given, yes. Okay. That was the impression that I didn't, I didn't allow him to see the kids when he was here, so, um... I was going to be punished. That's what I felt. That doing the right thing to try to protect my children was the wrong thing in the court side. Now, do you have paperwork from DHS or the shelter or anything from your children that, um, in which they documented um, post-traumatic stress disorder or your son's diagnosis of Tourette's? Yes, I do. I have, well, and... Since we have been here, um, uh, my son's twin sister has been diagnosed with Asperger's and PTSD. I'm familiar with that because I worked in the mental health field prior to getting involved with advocacy. But just to let the general public know, Asperger's is a mild form of autism. They're generally high-functioning um, people that that have Asperger's and they're often very very intelligent um, yes and um, I uh, she was um, diagnosed last year um, I've known it for a very long time but uh, I another was in another fight with that to, to get her the the help that she needed in order to be able to, you know, use her her smarts because she is very very intelligent and uh, an artist, and she has done a lot of healing. I mean, she she has uh, been able to do what the intention was for us to come here um, was to heal. And um, so she has, she has surpassed anything that I could ever 
she's she's going to college. She's going to be going to college. Um, she's in eleventh grade, and I'm now um, have filed for custody here in the state of Wyoming and fighting for custody for her because because she has been with me for four years, and um, so back into the court system again. However, this time it will be, I believe, different. Um, the DFS system, it has been very uh, um, supportive um, because um, my daughter has opened up more regarding the abuse um, and her uh, GAL also, which is guardian ad litem. Yeah. Um, so there, there are things continuing to happen. Um, I'm also uh, going to be going back to court in Iowa also because I feel that I, I should, I do have the right to see my own son um, and to have a relationship with him. And that's something that I believe the court, the family court system took away from me. I would like to ask you something that I imagine all of our viewers are wondering. How did it come to the point that your ex has one of the children and you have the other? If they believe you are incompetent to the point where you need supervised visitation, how can they entrust you with taking care of the child that you do have custody of? Um, well, uh, the first year we were here, all of us, um, my daughter uh, was, and I agreed to it, to have her put on a chins, which is a child in need of supervision, uh, through the juvenile court. Um, she needed some extra help. She was really having a hard time dealing with life. Um, she was cutting. Um, and a, I, I know where a lot of it stemmed from. Um, she was hospitalized at one time. Um, so this is something that she just needed some extra help. Well, um, that is the reason why her father knew that a juvenile order supersedes any other order from anywhere else. So he knew, evidently he knew, that if he would have taken her also, that he would have been in trouble with the, the state of Wyoming. So he left her with me and uh, just took my son. So um, I, you know, that, that's the reason why she is still with me is because she has had this uh, chins petition and um, they, her worker has been very, very um, understanding and wanting to help in any way that she can, which is a, a lot of opposite that I had experienced in the state of Iowa. So um, it's still, you know, a little different for me to, to, to trust that you know, is real, but um, I, I can see over and over again that things are, you know, they are for her. They are for my daughter. Right. They believed her, and um, they're willing to help. So, um, Lucas, I don't think I was supposed to say his name, but um, my son... He uh, has, he doesn't have that support in the state of Iowa that my daughter does here. That's too bad. So is your son getting any assistance with the issues that he has and everything he's being forced to deal with? No. No. In fact, he was on an IEP in school 
and uh, he was taken off of it also. Um, his grades have slipped. Um, I have numerous um, things on, uh, I, the only way that I know of anything is I get on uh, the website for his schooling and there have been numerous parties, um, numerous absences or, you know, different periods that um, they couldn't find him. Um, and yet, it, nothing is being done about it. So while your daughter is blooming and doing really well, your son unfortunately does not have this, that same situation. Another thing that really strikes me with your situation in particular, Lisa, that these children who have been together since they were in your womb have now been separated. And that's very unhealthy for twins. There's a very special bond between twins, whether they are fraternal or identical. Correct. And it does, it, it breaks my heart. I mean, that is the, that is the one thing that breaks my heart the most is that a court system would separate twins knowing, I mean, it says in this order that um, my daughter had a chins petition. So the court in Iowa knew that he was not going to be able to take hope. And I know I said her name, I'm sorry, but um, that's okay. You're allowed to share as much or as little of your case as you want to. It's difficult with teenagers because of their access to the internet um, and what's out there online. We understand that they don't want to be embarrassed by things and they don't want their friends, of course, to see about um, what has taken place with their parents, especially if it's not positive. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to, Lisa, just leave it to the point that we're going to assume that your children don't have the same last name as you. Even if they don't, or even if they do have your last name, Smith is, I think, common enough that it won't directly, you know, they, it won't be directly pointed to them by friends that may come across this. I guess where I get stuck is that why a court system would do something like that, um, knowing that uh, children are, okay, they are resilient, but when they're separated from their primary person that's taking care of them all of their life and having to basically, I mean, go back into an uh, abusive um situation, why would professionals want that? And it, it just, that's where I have consistently been stuck, is not understanding that. Because my brain can't, you know, it, it just can't, it can't understand it. It's my opinion, and I think we, you know, should really feel blessed that we don't understand where they're coming from. Um, if we did, we would be on the same wavelength and mindset as the perpetrators. Now, we've talked about a lot on your case. What was your work at the time that you were married? Um, it's clear from what you said you have never been accused of abuse or neglect. What was your profession at the time that you were with your ex-husband and your abuser? Well, when I was... Um when I was married, I, I did stay home for quite a while um, with the kids um, because we, at the time, there were four children. And um, then uh, I became a lunch lady for the school district um, in Marshalltown. And uh, I was a, a, a lunch lady for about uh, three years. And then there, um, I, I knew I was going to need um, more uh, full-time employment, so I uh, 
went in for an interview to be a paraeducator for uh, special needs kids in the preschool for the school district. And so for the last um, three years before um, I had to give up my position in order to come here to Wyoming, and um, it, it has been, um, I, I loved my job, I loved working with the children, um, having uh, the experience that I have with, with the twins, um, it, it was very, very rewarding, and um, I, I'm hoping to um, get back into that. Um, however, uh, the things that have gone on with the with the court system and with the kids um, has been my first priority. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's completely understandable. That seems like something that you'd be really good at, um, especially with your experience with your own children. Correct. Yes. Yes, because I live it every day. I mean, um, it, it's something that I've I've been uh, involved with on a daily basis. So um, I I guess that's what. You know, God says said that I He wanted me to do. That's awesome that you can take your experience. I also understand that you're advocating for other moms um, that are in similar situations as you are. You are doing really good at that. Um, I've personally known Lisa for many, many years. Anytime anybody has an issue, she just really jumps in and helps with whatever she possibly can. Um, I just want to emphasize that these protective moms who are affected by the courts and these injustices in the court system are people that reach out to help others with absolutely nothing that they expect in return. Um, that it's not for personal gain, it's just to help the children solely. Um, and I found that with many of the women that I've worked with. It's not about our indiv individual it's not about our individual cases. It's about what we can do together and to bring justice to these judges who are utilizing the law in a way it was never intended to be. These laws were meant to protect children and not meant to harm them or put them in harm's way. I am. I, uh, and I will continue. Um, regardless of what's going on with my, my case, I will continue to advocate uh, for other um, other protective moms and for uh, um, I'm a volunteer for domestic violence. Um, I have I, I want to um, I want this to mean something. I want this to the the pain that is that it has happened, I want it to, um, something good to come out of it. And um, so I will never be silent again. I will raise my voice to this, um, to bring awareness of what is really going on in our family court system. Lisa, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me tonight and I thank you so much for opening up about your case. Um, I really believe that these children one day will have access to these videos when they're older and when they can understand more of what's going on and they will see that we're fighting for them and they will know that that they're loved and they're cared for. Um, keep up what you're doing. You're doing awesome with your advocacy. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you for watching. We will return next week with the continuation of this episode of Silent Voices with Lisa Smith. Thank you.
If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. Hello, I'm a child protective worker. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice makes, makes the, the difference. difference.